<laughs> it's awesome, funny, random, doesn't make any sense, but it's good. Hi everyone and welcome back to the channel. It is the 30th of June 2022 and this evening we're doing something slightly different. We're starting a new mini-series all about the Mormon Temple. Um, before we do, just so everyone has a good idea of where we're going with this, uh, what I wanted to do was take a high-level look at the history of the temple ceremony and there is so much scholarship out there about the history of the temple ceremony that to take a in-depth look, I don't think I'm smart enough to do that. And it would take weeks and months. And that's a whole, you know, master's thesis in itself. So we're going to take a higher level look where we just discuss and possibly point out some of the good bits, some of the not so good bits and how it's changed over the years, you know, how it came to be and then how it's changed to what we have today. Now, many people might be thinking, how in depth are we going to go when it comes to, um, you know, the more sacred parts of the ceremony? And we've decided, uh, me and my friends as a group of people, uh, that we are going to respect other people's, uh, you know, covenants and beliefs and the covenants that we made at one time. And we won't be uh, going in depth with those things. There are other places on the internet, if you wish to, that you can find those. But in this, we're going to be looking more at some of the nuts and bolts and how it changed over time. And uh, President Bed or Elder Bednar, um, he has given us permission to talk about this because in 2019, um, this LDS Living article titled Five Gifts We Are Given When We Receive Our Temple Endowment and What to Expect. Uh, it's, this is from September. 2019 and he says here guideline one because we love the lord we always should speak about his holy house with reverence i don't know if we're going to tick that box but he says we should not disclose or describe the special symbols associated with the covenants received in the sacred temple ceremonies neither should we discuss holy information but that's all he says we should discuss we may discuss basic purposes and the doctrines and principles associated with temple ordinances and covenants so there, there is this whole secrecy around the temple ceremony, but uh, a leader from the Mormon church has given us permission to discuss the temple ceremony as long as we don't um, give away all the stuff. So who will we be discussing this with this evening? Um, I don't know if you can guess by now, uh, but I only have a few friends and I've brought them with me. So we have uh, Julian and Laura Heath. We have Peter Bleakley of the Mormon Civil War and Nemo the Mormon, who needs no introduction. Hey, guys, how are we doing? Hey. Hey. Oh, thank you. Doing well. You, you don't sound convincing. I'm, I'm very tired. <laughs> yes, I'm knackered. Mormon. I've been teaching all day. Why are you really somebody, tired? Man? Somebody but, had but a totally Mormon Stories interview last night. Somebody did very well in their Mormon stories it interview last night. Really, and somebody really kept me up to the wee hours telling amazing stories in their Mormon stories interview last night. Oh, you started it. And we late. stayed up watching it. This guy. <laughs> yeah. No, it was it was it was fantastic. Um, I was on Mormon stories last night, and yeah, I'm still recovering. So if I fall asleep, because temples do that to you, they induce comas. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if i do if someone's it's called meditating like, running to the temple though pd yeah are we are we going to have 45 minutes near the beginning Pondering. where we can all like close our eyes until we then have to do something you know what i used to think so you're in the temple and you've got this lovely white tie and you fall asleep and you kind of drool a little bit and after a few um goes at the temple if you get the drool in a good pattern it just looks like the pattern on the tie <laughs> oh that's grim oh come on <laughs> dribble paisley never yes oh. is that why you had an evening <laughs> one <laughs> it's <too absorbable. laughs> oh my days right um so mine got was white paisley way. white paisley he just, he's he a just, refined uh, man of culture you're too posh so we have got some more current information we're going to start with because last night 
after um, the Mormon Stories interview, John DeLynn uh, posted some information about the current temple situation here upon the earth. Um, you can see my uh, kind of picture to the side here on the right. That is Russell M. Nelson in his younger days trying to plug every hole in the dike with temples um, because that seems to be the church's go-to at the minute. Let's just throw temples at them and that'll fill it. Uh, but John wrote here, and it's been shared around social media, um, so it's, it's not um, probably not new to a lot of you. Major discord, it's hard to gauge, but there are social issues that have divided not just the 12th, but also the 70s. I will also add that the temple department is waning. I was in a meeting last week, and the focus was the precipitous drop in temple recommend holders worldwide. It's so much of an issue that we cannot even partially staff the current temples we have open. There is a serious concern about the announced and under construction facilities yet to operate. The original thought was that COVID protocols were keeping members from renewing their recommends, but now we're coming out of the pandemic and the rates of non-renewals are still climbing at an unprecedented rate. People mm. talk. Well, it's not surprising, is it? It's not surprising at all. It's been known for a while that Russ M. Nelson has been building temples in an unsustainable and erratic way, just announcing them willy-nilly. So it wasn't a carefully thought out plan. And then combine that with the pandemic and just the overall drop of members in the church, active bums on seats are disappearing left, right and centre. There's there's nothing. There's, there's no one to man the temples. Birmingham Temple, I don't know how it's going to operate. Well, yeah. if, if, as we said before, this will accelerate the destruction of the wards in mm -hmm. these areas because they'll every available manpower or woman power will need to go and run the temple. And that means they're not ministering, they're not doing missionary work, they're not dealing with the living people. Um, and this can only accelerate the decline of these very fragile and shrinking wards. It's a disaster. They'll become like a black hole sucking the life out of every area that they're plonked in I, I think mary's comment here is fantastic can you imagine a nightclub in a temple in all the different rooms you'd just leave the names the same you'd be like the celestial room with dj danny dog on the decks i'm gonna know? i'm gonna buy it's gonna be called hotel nemo i'm gonna buy one it'll be a nightclub <laughs> called hotel nemo what do you do with all those cows in the basement though mm. Like mm. you turn them into like one of those bull rides, like those oh. bucking bronco rides. I mean, it'd be lethal because they're like solid metal, but you know, no, no, you get people sign quite easy because they also don't um, move. You guys... It'd be like the least exciting bucking bronco ride ever. It's just people sitting on cows, really, isn't it? Like, <laughs> yeah, cow statues. I, no. I would like to see that. Have you... <laughs> Have you seen, we, have we've you... gone straight to insulting TBM sensibilities. Let's rein yeah. it back in, people. Do I need to, we are here to talk about serious stuff too? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I was thinking of vodka. You're not just going to sit here and and mock temples. We might a little bit, but that's not the main purpose. Peter is here to bring us all back down to earth and mm. give what the would Jane balance. Do? Well, <laughs> is that the Jane. mantra in your head, Peter? Jane? Jane was would have loved to have been here this evening, but Jane's bishop, I know, is concerned about this stuff. So she's made the sensible decision not to antagonize him. And so that's what Jane would do. And that's probably the most sensible thing to do in this situation. But we're all here now, so we might as well carry on. So let's ignore it. <laughs> yeah. Um, hi, Jane, if you're listening, just come on the next one. Screw him. Um, Sorry, we just love you. Right, so I had a look at what the actual situation was with temples under construction, etc. And um, there's this website here, and the link is in the show description below. But we've got 51 temples under construction, seven under renovation, and 58 announced. And those 58 that are announced are pretty much still in planning process. It's now and... a bad time to mention, P 
DVD that I got sent a, a Google Earth file that's got pins for every single temple and it's color coded as to whether they're under construction or around. I possibly could have sent you that as a visual aid, couldn't I? You know, <laughs> the whole point in showbiz is you don't tell everyone what the mistake was. Well, no, because the <laughs> thing is now we can just bring it up in a later episode and we we'll, can. We'll, we'll get people ready for it. I'll send you that. Yeah. Um, but I had, a, I had a quick look down here at announced temples. And if you look at the dates of some of them um, here, when they're Shanghai. groundbreaking, Shanghai, but some of them go back to 2018. Mm -hmm. April 2018 announced, but still in the planning process. Here you go. Temple announced 1st of April 2018, Russia. Why did they announce that? Yeah, Russia. Why aren't they building that? There's no excuse, <laughs> is there? No What's excuse. wrong with them? But what about plenty of prime real estate? Nicaragua. Yeah. Yeah, Philippines. First of April, Philippines. First of April, twenty eighteen. Lagos, Nigeria. Seventh of October, twenty eighteen. So it'll be really interesting to see in October. Well, how many on average is he announcing? Sort of eleven was it the last time? Was it eleven? Or have I just pulled that? The, out? the last, the last time took him up to one hundred announced by okay. the president. On Austin. average, is he kind of announcing sort of tenish? So I'm just thinking, 10 what's he going to be announcing? I think yeah. ten yeah. or twelve. Because if what does waning mean? It says on there, it said, uh, and whether this has been lost in translation or, or whether that was the original wording, but the temple department are waning. Is that sim uh, simply resources or is that someone? Um, they're, they're creaking under the stress. They're yeah. starting to, you know, it's getting them down. And is it, you know, discord in the 12, is it, um, are they able to wane a bit because they've got sympathetic ears in the 12 that allow allow them to kind of have a bit of a sounding board to say, look, this isn't working. We just haven't got the numbers for this. We haven't got the numbers that are actually going to man these and women, these temples. Um, but we we haven't got the means to, to even break ground for another four or five years. Yeah. Well, who even knows? Lanessa um, has made a good point. Are they doing it just to dump funds? You know. But then they can be seen to be spending money on their purpose as a church because I think it's one of those use it or lose it type situations. You've got to be seen to be doing something. Yeah. And the other thing, I, I can see this being something in a few years' time that we have empty temples, but they say that it was needful that we built these temples so that they're ready in the millennium to be used. Yeah. Yes. Or in you know, preparation oh, for great growth. Coming in the so area they have like yes. a skeleton staff to keep them it was inspired up to date but yeah so mm. or or it'll be mm. every other week you know mm. it'll be like, Time like the, uh, the closing of the litchfield stay you know these these empty temples are the culmination of 100 years <laughs> hard work <laughs> you know Oh, little did we know when there was we a dedicated comment. this temple. <laughs> there was a comment earlier about that, well, they'll need to start lowering the age. I I mean, honestly, I think we should watch out for things like that because there is a big, yes, because they, they've they um, got a big push at the moment to make going to the temple a big part of what young people do. They've had them indexing the boring files for the family history they they've really pushed it as something regular they've got younger and younger people you know YSAs being temple ordinance workers and so on as far mm -hmm. as I can tell so they they've definitely got this idea that it's, I think it's like the last unique selling point that they care about or know how to do um because they've screwed up the whole mission program so spectacularly and they put Uckdorf in charge to fix that and it absolutely has not changed they haven't fixed it except some backtracking on trying to jump people into a font within three minutes. Um, so nothing's happening there. Uh, perfect the saints. Well, educating the saints is is kind of not working. Ministering is not working. Hardly anyone's doing it because they've watered it down to, to meaninglessness. So ultimately, the only sort of solid Mormon thing they've got left to hold on to is the temples. And geriatric old men can't think of anything else to entertain the young people. Um, so you just see, you know, you know you, I'd, I'd be, I mean, it could back, turn back to the early days when they were pumping t young teenagers through the Nauvoo Temple before they had to flee west. You know, they could well use that as a precedent to say, well, we could, let's endow people at 12, but, at 16. There's a you huge know, all kinds of problem stuff there. 
there's a massive yeah. safeguarding issue that would become a, a large concern mm. the moment you have people not of legal age entering the temple mm. because mm. you know you, yeah it's, it's a safeguarding problem that they are entering into promises with an organization as a minor because these are mm. these are commitments you're making to an organization mm. um based around you know they're not legal commitments but they are still religious mm. ceremonies that sure. require a lot of i could see that being a real problem because the it's it's <laughs> really hot on safeguarding isn't it yeah i i, I can't like... imagine the idea that because the thing is or, or here's the other thing right we we can tell people about what happens in temples with 12 year olds for baptisms for the dead and for um confirmations for the dead right but at the moment we have to show someone legally every step of the endowment ceremony because otherwise they will not allow children to go in and do that, you've got a problem. The church isn't going to want to have to say, look, this is fine for children to participate in because any sort of any sort of safeguarding organization is going to want to know what's happening there, right? Surely. But they could say yeah. with a parent, couldn't they? Hmm. Is that the I way around it? Anyway, I, I don't think... I don't think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that they're what's driving them is a desire to have more people go to the temple. I, I just don't. I don't think it is. I think you know. And you said there, Peter, about them kind of ruining everything else. They've ruined the temple. They've all, that, that's ruined. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at what temples used to be and what used to go on there, and now. Mm -hmm what it's like now they have just ruined it i think i mean i could go on forever about this and i'll try not to but they need to take for a start they need to take the focus off of um work for the dead it's, it's, it's pointless it's pointless it doesn't make any sense it, you know if that's really the purpose then surely you know we've all been there and done work for the dead and seen how you know you'll be baptized for and in behalf of mr smith you know mm. which you know, you might as well just get somebody. Well, if that's what it's really about, then then the prophet can just go there and just go. Right, I baptize you for and in behalf of everybody that has died, and mm -hmm. then just do it, and then it's done. That you know, that, that, just like the atonement, because that's what the atonement was, wasn't it? He didn't name everybody individually. He said, right, I'm just going to do it for everybody. Um, so so this this emphasis on on doing it for people that that have died, I just think is pointless. If you want people to be there, make the emphasis an enjoyable experience for the people that are there. M my mum used to love going to the temple. But the only reason that she loved going to the temple was because she had a really strong love of um, a family history work. And if you would have said to my mum, right, really exciting news. They've changed the endowment now. It's 10 minutes she would have been ecstatic. She would have thought that's fantastic because it means I can get so many more names done. I can do all of this work for my ancestors that have gone before. She wasn't enjoying actually being there. She wasn't enjoying the experience. It wasn't a powerful experience for her. It was just, let's get as many done as we can because I feel like I'm, I'm doing something, you know, to help my, my ancestors. So if, if you want to get, or if you want to get people in the temple, Focus on the people that are going to the temple. Make it a good experience. We could do that. And I've got some suggestions. I might come on to them later. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I um, last week I interviewed uh, Lady C and JT, who were ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, and we got to talking about the temple and what they thought of the temple and what they knew about the temple. And when we got to talking, it seemed like their whole missionary work is kind of they give everyone the opportunity to become a witness and anyone that chooses not to is then they're going to burn and, and be you know just gone in the rapture etc and that only the witnesses are saved and that that's why they're really serious about everything whereas i said well for mormons it's different because if you reject it it's okay because when you die we're going to make you a mormon anyway <laughs> you know those guys someone's going to do it's, your work it's eventually. a plan b <laughs> yeah so it doesn't mm. matter like why are we even going out and doing missionary work because surely the better way is to eat drink and be merry in this life not know about the gospel have a good time and then someone does your work for you and then when you're in spirit prison you're like oh yeah no i wish i'd have known that maybe 
um yeah i'm good with that now <laughs> let's go um mm. this is an image here from philadelphia recently um a couple of years ago with all the youth um and parents you can see down here some of these kids are small you know and they're is, already that's literal temple worship is russell I, nelson I, I, about I, to I, pop out of it like a stripper gram out of a cake <laughs> cake i'll put that on my tally i'll put that on my tally that's, that's <laughs> sorry that's going on the tally right then <laughs> um, moving on I, I look I, having just watched keep sweet Mm -hmm. no bay. this could be an image out of the flds oh yeah, it, it, yeah. We, mm. it's interesting that we would show that and not and not see that as quite disturbing it's got some real fundy vibes doesn't it mm. yeah mm. and i think you can wonder see... if that's why they stopped doing these things um because they you know the a few years ago they they'd started to build up again i think to engage young people um this they'd have a cultural celebration for several years before mm. the dedication or rededication of a temple celebrating local culture getting hundreds or thousands of the youth in the area to sing and dance and do a celebration and i thought that was really quite positive because it was about for the first time not just exporting american culture it seemed to be mm. about celebrating what the local culture and people meant and what they they contribute to the world you know um but a, a picture like that just is so culty off the scale i'm but, wondering if it was publicity around that that kind of triggered them to just stop doing I'd, it at I'd all i'd love to see the cultural um, celebration around the yeah. birmingham temple like morris men <laughs> they've, they've already brought their own Blind hankies face. ready Peaky for the blinded. hosanna shout so they're they're ready for the Hosanna shout. They've got their hankies and they're just going to jump up and down with bells on. I think that would be excellent. No. And then they all pull out I'll, I'll machine guns out and, and do a Peaky Blinder organize. massacre. What, what did you What did you say, Julian? I've been asked to organise it. The Morris dancing. Uh, the whole thing. The, all the, right. The, the, the Birmingham Temple celebration. Wow. Excellent. But I think you make what? a really good point, we Peter, about the cultural anyway. celebrations. I think I think they were positive, yeah. but unfortunately, stuff like this when mm. it when it's then an American cultural celebration, what is the American culture that the church espouses? Certainly, is this? Yeah, it's, it's funny actually, isn't it? Um, the the idea of you know you kind of saying tongue in cheek about a Birmingham celebration, but the thing is in, Brit in Britain we don't we just don't do that kind of thing, do we? <laughs> we don't celebrate yeah. stuff. We just kind of go, yeah, but, you know. Well done. I'm running the temple. Good. Yeah. yeah. And then we'll go home. Congratulations. <laughs> Too British to really celebrate something. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, you can't say that after the Platinum Jubilee celebrations. Come on. We oh, have our no, moments. Don't, don't get me started, don't Peter. Peter don't but we need a marching band and a queen. Oh, the bloody Northern Socialists. Look at them. <laughs> <laughs> Killjoys. Right. Bitter. Right. Bitter yeah, is wind, what you are. Wind your neck in. Right. So. <laughs> today, today, uh, the mighty Mormon freedom fairy, Lindley Clee, let us all know that in the Liahona, um, that they're still slinging around the world, that they've, they're hitting on temples. And I don't know if that is uh, to do with John's information, that they're having trouble with the temple recommends. It could be to do with uh, what we saw a few weeks ago when they spoke about the Birmingham temple and they closed the stakes and they encouraged everyone to... Uh, sort yourself out whether it's um, you need to catch up with your tithing because tithing receipts are down or stop. I think watching... this has been in the works a little bit longer, actually, because a, a number of months ago, there was a change made to the church handbook of instructions and it started to list more explicitly what goes on inside the temple. And it was also said to John around that time, uh, an insider source said to him, that David A. Bednar, the man who published this article, uh, has been working on a new temple prep curriculum that apparently is going to be more mm. um, informative and help people really understand. Because, for example, in in the that's what they couldn't say. Could be less informative. <laughs> really? no, it couldn't. Really? It couldn't. Could it be any less informative. Than it's it's entirely right? uninformative. But in in on the church handbook, it it lists the covenants you make. It talks about the law of consecration, the law of sacrifice. Um, it, mm. the law of chastity it mm. talks about the covenants and the areas around which you will make covenants in the temple which is fairly groundbreaking because that used to be very hush hush well that's what they do here in this article that i read at the mm. beginning because bednar says here um that uh, this first 
the temple is a sacred place and ordinances in the temple are sacred are of a sacred character because of its sacredness we sometimes we are sometimes reluctant to say anything about the temple to our children and grandchildren as a con consequence many do not develop a real desire to go to the temple or when they go there they do so without much background to prepare them for the obligations and covenants they enter into I believe a proper understanding or background will immeasurably help prepare our youth for the temple and will foster within them a desire to seek the priesthood blessings. Yeah, I think this needs this needs applauding to an extent. Yeah. I think it needs acknowledging as, as a positive. They may not get it right. In fact, chances are they still will fail to be fully transparent, but it is a, absolutely a positive step in the right direction towards some sort of informed consent before you enter the temple. An overview of the endowment. Uh, yeah. So I just want to say, Laura received a survey recently. So um, they must have had so much feedback oh, from the surveys, mine, and they have asked about this. Of yeah, of um, people saying my experience at the temple was terrible and traumatic because the prep was terrible. You know, countless um, people have had their testimonies derailed at the moment they went to the temple because the preparation was awful. They, it was so completely different to anything they'd experienced in normal church life. Um, and uh, I just think, you know, they, it, this surely is a sign that they're finally listening to their own surveys, which are telling them how many people are traumatized by not having good preparation. Mm. Um, and it, it really messes some people up. Um, so so yeah, I well think this is a, a positive outcome of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah and um let's let's move forward because our time is far spent uh we don't want this to be as we said it's a high level look um at because there's just so much information so moving forwards uh before we do just made this lovely little graphic it'd be great if we could get 100 likes on this video because oh. that would help with the youtube algorithm a like just for making the graphic please um so yeah everyone give it a like and anyone who feels they can support the show um in an extra special way there's a paypal link in the description below now on with the juicy stuff um so we've got brigham young why do we need temples um does anyone volunteer to read that so my dodgy reading's not uh, going all night well i feel like i'm in sunday in, school in your best brigham voice oh you go. No, you go. You, no, no, yeah, no. lecturers. Come on, guys. <laughs> Your endowment is to receive all those ordinances in the house of the Lord, which are necessary for you after you have departed this life, to enable you to walk to, it, to the presence of the Father, passing the angels who stand as sentinels, being enabled to give them the key words, the signs and tokens pertaining to the holy priesthood, and gain your eternal salvation in spite of earth and hell. Okay. So just like that yeah mm. but the, the reason that i put brigham young first and not joseph smith is because for us as modern day temple um endowed mormons that is what the temple is all about mm -hmm. it is about receiving your endowment receiving the signs and tokens so that you may pass the angels at standard sentinels but that is not what the endowment was originally about the endowment like a lot of mormon theology started with a small seed and then progressed over the years as the joseph's theology progressed um so before we move on guys does anyone have anything to say about big brigham's uh beat there yeah um, so, so this is this is the definition that we get of the the, the purpose of the endowment, mm -hmm. um, but it's nonsense. <laughs> Absolute nonsense. It, 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 it is, and, and and that's part of the problem. Mm. The re one of the reasons that that the, the temple is so problematic at the moment is because we're not really focusing on why. Again, this doesn't make any sense. You know, we all know that it doesn't make any sense. The whole idea that, that when we leave this life, we've got to go through this um, this process um, in, a, in a, any kind of literal sense is just ridiculous. You know, like you, 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 
the, the best person in the world and then you get there and you're at the veil and God says, no, sorry, you, you, you don't know all the, the key words and signs and tokens. Sorry about that. You, you're going to have to go somewhere else or, you know, or, oh, I forgot what was it I was supposed to say. Uh, um, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's silly. It doesn't make any sense in that sense. So if we're going to make any value out of the temple, we've, we've really got to deconstruct this and say why. Now, I love the temple. Well, no, okay, love is a strong word. Um, uh, there's a lot about the temple that I like. Um, I'm a big fan of ritual. And I um, I had, you know, pretty much all of my experiences at the temple were enjoyable. Um, I like hats, you know, so that helps. Um, mm-hmm. And... Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you know, and, and I'm really missing a trick. You know, I, I think what what I wanted to say is this is this is something that Joseph got right. I think you know, and Brigham by extension. This is something that 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 they got right. And if you look at every um, ancient civilization um, mm-hmm. and culture, there are elements of the temple there. And it's because it works. There are elements of it that work. There are elements of the ritual that work. And what we need to do... Work for what, though? Well, but that's all part of the the um, the, the the debate that needs to... I mean, I know I've got my views on how it works. I think, I think unfortunately, and maybe this is being super cynical, I, I, I'll accept this, but maybe it, what's happened now is that they've said, well, it works to get people to pay tithing. You know that's how it works, and and I don't think that's the purpose. Don't I think sacrifice is is a purpose. I think sacrifice is important. Um, again, you know, it's a it's an, an element that that has been in these kind of um, rituals and services throughout history. Um, but I don't think it's the number one purpose. Um, you know, there is th- this idea of being endowed with power from on high. Um, and, you know, we should, if we were doing it right, we should come out of the temple feeling empowered. We should come out of the temple feeling that we've really, really gained something from it, feeling renewed, feeling refreshed. Um, and some people might get that. that that's fine. Um, but I don't think that is really the purpose. And so we, we throw out something like this, you know, Brigham's quote, and say, well, this is the, 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 the meaning of the endowment or the purpose of the endowment. Like that answers the question, and it it just doesn't doesn't answer the question at all because it doesn't make any sense. Um, are, are you, sorry, I know I'm. I'm, I'm can, can I suggest a way it could make sense? Um, I mean, obviously, finish your point, but I want. Oh, all I was going to say, it's it's something that was good. groundbreaking for me in, in my view of Mormonism is um, section um, nineteen of the Doctrine and Covenants, where you know God says, "Hey, listen, folks." But he doesn't actually say that. I'm paraphrasing. Um, that's not that, that's not the exact language. I can't remember exactly what was said. Um, I, this is the NIV version of the of the Doctrine and Covenants. <laughs> the hippie translation yeah. of Doctrine and Covenants. Hey, I love listen, it. folks. Okay. When I said you do one. <laughs> when I said eternal damnation, right, or eternal punishment, I think it is. When I said eternal pu- punishment, I didn't really mean eternal punishment. Um, you know, I said that because my name is eternal and it's God's punishment. So God's punishment is eternal punishment. But I didn't really mean it, would, it wouldn't would have an end. I just use that language because that language will work on your mind and get you to, um, you know, get you to do the things that I need you to do for, for your good. And, and so, you know, when I looked at that, I, I realized that, that, you know, God isn't um, above playing little games with us, like little psychological games to get the desired outcome, you know. And so I've no doubt at all, if we take this as a literal view, you know, when we get there and we're all ready, right, I've, I've done it, I've got my, my signs and my tokens, I'm going to get in, I know it all, it's going to be fine, then God will meet us there and go, okay, look, when I said you needed these things to pass by the angels that stand as sentinels, I didn't, re- you know, I didn't really mean it, but this is what I was trying to get out of it. And I think that's what we need to try and understand and focus is what what we're really supposed to get out of it. And I think that if the leadership of the church had that focus, rather than just the, uh, just appearance, then um, 
then you know I think it could be a lot more beneficial for people. It could be a lot healthier. You mean well. gen- people could genuinely go there for peace? Yeah, I, I, I do believe that, and could go there and have a good experience. It's almost like it's almost. Sorry, I really am ranting now. It's almost. Like, I, I talk about. I'm a teacher, so I talk about this a lot as a teacher. And one of the problems in education is that there are two games going on. We're playing two different games. We've got the majority of people, the the teachers at teacher level, and and you'll you'll know what I'm talking about here, Peter. Their their goal is to educate children. That's the game that they're playing. But then you've got this level at the top where their game is to convince Ofsted. And to to you know, when the Ofsted come in, can we pull it off? And and they don't those things don't necessarily match up. And as a result of that, the people at the bottom are not getting the best experience. The users are not getting the best experience from me. And I think that to some extent that's what's going on in the church. You know, we still think that it's all about being Christ-like and following um, Christ's example and, and all of this stuff. But the people at the top are trying to make things look good. And I think, you know, all of these these temple announcements is a, is a really clear example of that. It's just how can we, can we convince people that it's not all falling apart um, and they're not matching up and we need to get those things matching up? Okay. I'll show up. It's all right. Let's, um, let's find out when it all starts. No, I'm- yeah. Yeah, that's right, Peter. We've moved on. Sorry. That's fine. <laughs> okay. No, move on. We'll before, get there. We're doing a series. Before we do, uh, for Peter, uh, Peter has written this or b- way back when in 2017, Peter wrote oh this Rational oh Faith words. article yeah. for the love, loathing, and laughter of the Temple Endowment. Uh, so a lot of Peter a lot of his yeah thoughts and prayers are in this article and the link is in the show notes below if later on you want to go and read that and i'm sure you know peter will tell us about it anyway so back to um the wonderful slides if i can find them yes so when did it start as early as october 1835 joseph smith told his apostles of an awaited endowment which would grant them power from on high. This endowment was considered at the time to be a spiritual endowment following washings and anointings. So it starts with a biblical practice because we can find washings and anointings in the Old Testament. And it starts with this seed that Joseph has and that these washings and anointings need to happen. And then the, the thought was at the time that After that, there would be this day of Pentecost type um, endowment of power that all these brethren would would get. Um, And that was what it was considered to be in the Kirtland era. Um, Any thoughts? Just that, really, that it it does have a biblical root. You know, at first Mm. it is riffing on this... um, idea of the rituals that were used for for washing and anointing and ordaining the temple priests in the old testament is quite elaborate there's ritual clothing there is um you know the 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 washings the the baptism and anointing rituals and those very much you know follow through in what you experience in the temple um and I guess, you know, the punchline really eventually is that he then experiences Freemasonry and that adds the rest. And it's these two ingredients that really come together very powerfully. And, you know, we were saying earlier, well, what what's, you know, as Julian was saying, the, the idea that you need a temple endowment to be saved is ludicrous because Christ saves, you know, it's his atonement. Um, but, and there is nothing in the Book of Mormon about temple endowments. Um, almost nothing in the new testament although one of the earlier versions of the gospel of mark mentions a little more going on with the young man who was um with jesus before he was arrested and sort of was ran away naked because somehow he there was some ritual going on and that could be taken as a hint of a washing and anointing type ritual which is in the secret gospel of mark um and there's nothing you know so jo- jo- where did joseph smith get this idea and why the whole of mormonism now is all pointing to the temple when there's nothing in the book of mormon about it anywhere you know the only temple stuff mentioned in the book of mormon is the the old testament rituals so it, i think it's this encounter later with freemasonry that really um 
introduces some really extraordinary and very powerful and wonderful and good stuff as yeah. well as what people find embarrassing about it so yeah. at this point you, he's riffing on the bible this is joseph's genius he yeah. goes to the bible he he takes the old testament very seriously he's he eventually produces the book of mormon sorry the well the book of mormon um the book of abraham pearl of great price stuff book of moses is all about old testament stuff it is really thrilling his imagination as he tries to look at rebooting this whole religion and not just being stuck on the the christian bit oi you didn't get that out for julian and he takes far longer than i do i would point <laughs> out again peter ruth is asking about <laughs> baptisms in the old testament yes um the two things sources there one is the the ritual washings that women had to do at the temple after having a baby um and that there was a font at the temple and that's mentioned and there was the um that you know there were the anointings and washings that were part of the priest being set apart and ordained yeah. um but also the Qumran stuff the dead sea scrolls uh which predate christianity um talk about a baptism ritual that was basically like a christian baptism so thank you doug um so um that also clearly points to judaism having a strong uh tradition of ritual washings and baptism type things and immersions and, and whatever um yeah. because the 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 community at the essenes whatever they're called at qumran were practicing that as a fundamental part of their religion and yeah. some people speculate that Jesus borrowed it from them. Okay. Yeah. So it well, was part of Jewish thought. Pre like the Old Testament as well. Yeah. And I think, uh, isn't there a thing as well, oh, if you are a that, convert Julian? to Judaism? Sorry. Sorry, Julian, what was that? I'm just saying a lot of a lot of these these themes and ideas predate the Old Testament as well. Oh, okay. You, know, you, you see them throughout ancient, you know, throughout ancient yeah. um, religion. I missed you, Peter. Sorry. But if you yeah, yeah, I was watching it. That's all right. I was watching a documentary about a guy who converted to Judaism and he had to get circumcised, poor thing, you know, as an adult. Um, oh. But the next, the other thing he had to do was a full immersion ritual of anoint of washing as a as part of the conversion to Judaism. I don't know if all branches practice it, but it seemed to be something that the Orthodox do. So that's something to research a bit. So again, it, it is there okay. in Jewish religion. Yeah. yeah, and something I was going to bring up, Peter, and that you've just touched. Can you imagine on. the chlorine after the operation. I guess they let him heal up a bit first. Can you imagine just going to the I don't toilet think it was after immediate. the operation? <laughs> anyway, um, pee in the bath. Pee in the bath. Um, so I was going to say the Book of Mormon <laughs> is a snapshot of time in the 1820s. But imagine if the Book of Mormon had been written in the 1840s, we wouldn't just have had um, Protestant Native Americans. We'd have had Protestant Freemason Native Americans, mm -hmm. because I'm sure if he'd written it later in the 1840s, he'd have included uh, great temples um, that the church would be absolutely like creaming their pants over because of these big pyramid temples that they're finding in uh, in South America and different things. You know, he missed a trick there, if I'm honest. But I mean, there's a common theme there. If the Book of Mormon had been written today, that we wouldn't have all the anachron the anachronisms because Mate, if the Book of Mormon today, had been, <laughs> been written today, we'd have more anachronisms because I swear like the Lamanites would have had nuclear weapons or something and they would have wiped out the Nephites far sooner than they did. Um, so, yeah. Anyway. It's interesting, actually, on the whole Freemason point that what we have got in the Book of Mormon is the opposite. Mm -hmm. It reflects an anti-Masonry yeah. um, rhetoric of the time. It, mm -hmm. it does mm -hmm. a, a yeah. real push against secret combinations. Okay. So let's talk about the actual ceremony then that he came up with. 35 to 36. Um, so you've got the pre-endowment ritual, which was a simple stage ceremony, clearly patterned after similar washings and anointings described in the Old Testament and especially the New Testament. Um, so the first off, and I don't know why, this would have been so much better. Why did we go to the whole creepy thing? Wash and purify the body with water and perfumed whiskey at home or... Mm -hmm 
at another place, not at the temple. They didn't do it at the temple at the time. And cinnamon perfumed whiskey, that sounds like a nice cocktail. I mean, this has this has links to, to Islam, the idea that before you attend mosque, you wash yourself at home. You, yes. you symbolically wash yourself in privacy. I mean, you can do it when you get there as well. There's washrooms there, but you, know, you uh, are able I... to, almost on an honor system, wash yourself, be clean and go. No, I used to work um, in Birmingham and we had, uh, there's a large Muslim population there. And there were several engineers in the office who were devout Muslims and we had a prayer room. And at certain times on the Sabbath, on the Friday, they would go and, and do their washings in, in the bathroom. And they'd, they'd slowly just stand at the sink and, and perform their washings before they went to pray in the prayer room. Um, so yeah, it's it's still a thing mm -hmm. that people do religiously. Um, but following that, you gather at the temple to be anointed with oil by Joseph or other church leaders. And when we say anointed with oil, we're not talking about they got out that little vial that was on their car keys um, and just put a little dab on. Some of the accounts of this anointing with oil and some of the accounts we'll get to later on in the Salt Lake Temple and other temples, there was a lot of oil, you know, going on. And they, you were anointed. It was a slippery affair. So, or a, a nasty scrape. Um, so the, the anointing was sealed by the uplifted hands. There, there was some um, mention of washing of feet, but I think we, we get to that later. Um, and then... So the first of these washings took place in the January, I think, of 36. And then in the March was the first solemn assembly, which was a big party in Shindig in the temple for all of the brethren, where they fasted and prayed for several days, awaiting this spiritual endowment, this day of Pentecost. And um, they drank several barrels of wine and then started seeing things. Mm. Comments. Wine on an empty stomach will do that to you. Yeah. Um, just before we get to that, that, I just wanted to make a real quick comment that, you know, the cards in the temple, the little laminated cards that you take around, if you go through the uh, washing and anointing area, there's little laminated cards that they put on a clipboard that you can read from so that the officiator can yeah. know what to say. It's interesting, there's scripture references on that. Really, there are, there are scripture references on there to Exodus Aaron. and other parts of. Yeah, it Pardon? talks about Aaron, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So it it basically it gives its scriptural justification for the way that washing anointings are done within the LDS Church. And what's interesting about that is that this very clearly is a legacy from the Kirtland ceremony through to now. There's there's a very scriptural basis to this and a very old world basis to all this, but yet there doesn't seem to be any sort of scriptural justification that literally for the endowment ceremony itself. Yes. No. Go on, Julian. Because, well, it's because it's secret, isn't it? So we won't have that. In, we won't find that in the scriptures because it's secret. <laughs> oh dear. Um, JC yeah. makes a point here that uh, Joseph Smith's anointing oils and wine were potentially steeped or spiked with <laughs> and theogen yeah. plants a theogen plants um the posh boy read that for me um seeing fascinating article by blankenagel um explains visionary early experiences naturalistically is that the one uh, that's called joseph smith and the magic mushroom is that that one i think it might be i think it talks about the uh time period of the hallucinations kind of matched quite well about six hour time period where they saw these visions and that's what your expected um period of reaction to those um to those mushrooms herbs whatever it was that you take i think that's the one um isn't it funny though how the church really bases a lot of um kind of stock in what happened at this solemn assembly with the visions um and we can see joseph and oliver there being visited um, with jesus upon the the mantle in the temple and elias and elijah and, and these great things that happened it was literally their day of pentecost and the church goes on about what these angels said and different things but really it was 
it was a piss up and you know if if church members when they were reading those scriptures because they always go on about context you can't take it out of context so if we put it in the real mm. context of these brethren hadn't eaten for several days or whatever in preparation for this and then they had drunk a buttload of wine mm -hmm. um you know that's a different context to put those scriptures in abundant amounts of alcohol abundant well i have a quote okay mm -hmm. Um, I wish I could get this up on the screen, but my computer wouldn't let me. This is from um, the book by David John Berger, mm -hmm. entitled uh, The Mysteries of Godliness, A History of Mormon Temple Worship. Really good book. Such and good book. anyone who can will be using that as we go along in these episodes. But this one is from a disaffected member who actually attended that meeting and gave a very interesting account of what happened so he gave this account in 1841 and his name was william harris um, by then a disaffected participant and he wrote in 1836 an endowment meeting or solemn assembly was called to be held in the temple at kirtland it was given out that those who were in attendance at the meeting should receive an endowment or blessing similar to that experienced by the disciples of christ on the day of pentecost when the day arrived, great numbers convened from the different churches in the country. They spent the day in fasting and prayer and in washing and perfuming their bodies. They also washed their feet and anointed their heads with what they called holy oil and pronounced blessings. In the evening, they met for the endowment. The fast then broke by eating light wheat bread and drinking as much wine as they saw proper. Smith knew well how to infuse the spirit which he expected um, to receive, which they expected to receive. So he encouraged the brethren to drink freely, telling them that the wine was consecrated and would not make them drunk. As many, uh, as may be supposed, they drank to the purpose. After this, they began to prophesy, pronouncing blessings upon their friends and curses upon their enemies. If I should be so unhappy as to go to the regions of the damned, I never expect to hear language more awful or more becoming the infernal pit than was uttered that night. The curses were pronounced principally upon the clergy of the present day and upon Jackson County mob in Missouri after spending the night in alternate, in alternate blessings and cursings at the meeting adjourned. It sounds like it turned into a rage room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just break everything. <laughs> it's just got a bit wild. I just think it's unreal that, like, and that was in the temple because the temples were different then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's but, a story but, but, of, of William Smith, you know, telling these, uh, threatening to beat Joseph up while he was at the pulpit at, you know, one of the one of the sermons in there. It was just a bit of a wild time, I think, yeah. and it, it not was, like we would recognise. No, we wouldn't. Um, but that's bad. It's a shame. Uh, so it was different, um, but they, they got it right. They got it right. We're the ones that have got it wrong be because we have sterilised the, the temple experience. You know, we've, we've for some, it's kind of like, you know, we've, We've taken this, the kind of ancient and Old Testament ideas of temples that were very much linked to festival and celebration, and we've mingled it with like ultra puritanical um, religion, and we've come up with something really dull. Um, and they hadn't quite got to that in the early church, mm -hmm. so there was dancing in the temple and and and, and drinking, you know, and there, there and there should be, you know, we kind of say. You know, we, we kind of take the mickey out of this idea of them drinking and, and having all these hallucinations. But but again, if you look at um, if you look at lots of other cultures that will use um, you know different plants that we know have got psychedelic properties to have what is for them a very very sacred ritual and this wonderful uplifting experience. That's not a bad thing. If we go back to why, what is the purpose? What are we as, as individuals, as human beings, suppose, forget about the people that are dead. They're dead. We don't need to worry about them. 
but the ones that are alive, what are we supposed to get out of it? Mm. And actually getting together like that and having a good drink and, and, and singing and, and dancing and praying together, it's probably a really, really powerful experience and, and, and one that I think I would probably enjoy much more than, than, than what we get now. There you go. So, you know, we were talking about how you get people back to your temples. How are you going to man a woman, mm. a Birmingham temple, um, hand out mushrooms? Mm. No, I'm joking. Hand out mushrooms. Oh, <laughs> brilliant. Or, <laughs> or just having as, yeah, I mean, I mean, what you're talking about there, Julian, is that the, the, the core experience <laughs> of all ancient religions and human civilization for, for thousands of years has been um, what we call animist religion, which believes that there are spirits of the dead ancestors all around us that communicate, they watch over us, they can be a threat, we need to placate them, we need to look after them, um, which is absolutely what goes on in the temple. Um, they tell creation myths, you get told the story of your tribe's view of how the earth was created and why human beings are within it. There's usually, it usually happens at the time of puberty, so there'll be lots of instruction in animist religion in, in getting away from an ordinary society into the lodge, into the sacred space, um, and being taught what your role as men and women are, and celebrating the fact that you're adults now and sexual, and you're going to make families and be responsible adults, and make commitments to sort of uphold the values of your community. The endowment does that. And this was one of the epiphanies for me that I kind of explore in that article for, for Rational Faiths is to, to suddenly realize that whether accidentally or not, the temple endowment ended up having all of these amazing ingredients. We bring back into Christianity um, a ton of stuff that is rich and, and vibrant and meaningful and life changing that has been sucked out of Christianity by Catholics, mm -hmm. although they tend to do more ritual, um, and certainly the Protestants. Um, and that gives us stuff to talk about with the whole of the world's religions. We should be rocking it in the East. We should be rocking it in, in for different reasons, in, in sort of tribal uh, Southern Hemisphere, in any culture where you still have animist religion being a big part because we talk about the same things we make those connections to our ancestors we engage in physical ritual we tell the stories of creation and our ancestors and our place in it we're absolutely doing the stuff that is normal for them but... and that is such a plus but our current leaders don't get any of that so they're sucking it all out they are one by one knocking out of the endowment the things that matter, particularly the live endowment, the ritual where you and your people get together and immerse yourself in reenacting these stories. And they've made it, you sit passively and watch a movie. Um, you know, and, but the, and this is the richness of masonry that we're losing. Yeah. There's a larger problem at play there. I think it's the mixture of this. Because the way you're describing it there is like it's an old Eastern religion temple, right? But... But, more more like, animist actually more, animist, more you know Papua but, New Guinea yeah but but the problem is the mixture with American culture or with Western culture and the gatekeeping of that experience by Temple Recommend by a desk mm -hmm. by a business like yeah. formality a transactional way of entering the building mm -hmm. you can't just turn up mm -hmm. like if if you could just turn up go through a short mm -hmm. put your robes on go through a short veil ceremony and then go to the session room and spend time there communing with your deceased ancestors feeling their mm. spirit that sort of thing if you could do that it would be a much different experience but there's a transactional nature you must give something first not to god but to the organization that's how i think it comes across to many it's mm. it's it's this there's a and they're policing you every second that yeah. you're there as you're mm -hmm. saying they're policing yeah. you you how long you can stay is up to them not you mm -hmm. So we've got three proposals so far for saving the temple for relevance. Yeah. One is get off your face on drugs and have a wild social experience. We've got bring back the deep meaning, you know, really explore the depth of the the everyman in the in the mummer's play, in the pageant, in the ancient ritual of the journey of life from creation to where you are now and looking forward to your children um, and have that intellectual, thought-provoking, spiritual journey vibe to it you know your 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 dream quest you know I'm just a small um, and, and nemo's 
<laughs> and yeah, Nemo's yeah. idea of let it be a place you can bring yourself to to just be to to have a sacred space to be quiet and pray and think like a, a christian cathedral is yeah you can, can just go in and it is a an awe-inspiring sacred environment but you can just sit and think for yourself if you want to yeah laura or a small fee i was just thinking about who i know that genuinely has a good experience of the temple they don't go because of that that transaction as such so i'm sure it's still in there but um and i've got we've got some friends who are tongan and i think they they experience it in a different way because of all of their culture when it comes to their ancestors mm -hmm. they are bringing that with them to their experience so they're actually having a completely different experience to us when they go there and so it does stand on its own merit um, that is a conduit for them to heaven and for some of their ancestors before. And so it, it is a beautiful, genuinely beautiful experience for them. I think that, like I said, I think that transaction is still there. And you've got a lot of ar arbitrary questions that you need to answer in order to get there and pay um, uh, a load of money. But they genuinely seem to be having a, a good experience. Yeah. But I don't Can know many other people that, that aren't having to give an awful lot sacrifice wise julian can I, can I just add as well that you know if we so if we're trying to fix the temple if that's what, is that our job now we're gonna, so. we're gonna brit rangers are gonna fix the temple um we're think, going to turn it into a nightclub <laughs> I'm sure that's think, where we started well yeah and and but again if we look at the early the early that's temples, what Curlin was. to some extent it was and and, and there's room for both I think that's the thing that there is space in in temple ceremony for both of those things. I think there needs to be an, an element of, or when I say it needs, I mean to get certain things from it. There needs to be an element of mystery, as as mm -hmm. a, as um, Captain Crash Idaho pointed out. I think, yeah, and and that that is very much um, you know ancient. It, it was it, it was always there. This element of of um, of mystery and also of. Um, so celebration and also e exclusivity as well you know it, it, you you are it's there are elements of it that are just there for the initiated you mean like the, a rite of passage well yeah that as well I, th I think there is i think there is room for all of these things and as we can see you know if you look if you look at the kirtland temple um and the narvu temple they they did that they there were all of those elements there um, what we've done is we've kind of drained it from anything other than this routine, um, you know, experience. And we've taken up from, you know, even that could be massively improved. Yeah. Well, I've just created a little poll on the YouTube. So everyone in the chat can vote because for me, I didn't enjoy the temple. It was a pain in the ass to have to go and do these things. And it was always a chore. Um, and that's probably random, you know, my issue. But uh, I just put simply, did you enjoy the temple? Yes or no? And everyone can vote and uh, and we'll see where people were falling. Because I think even, sorry? I'm off to vote. You're off to vote. We'll see you later. Mm. Uh, make sure you take your polling card. I will. Uh, but I think the church would be a very different place if those brethren at that solemn assembly had taken their wives. Because the wives... Well, first of all, they wouldn't have acted so silly because I know when I go on a night out, if my wife isn't there, it's no holds barred. And uh, the Heaths can account for that. But next time we go out, if Sister PD comes with me, we'll be reined in because Sister PD tells me when I'm being a tit or, you know, just lets me know. And I think a lot of those brethren, if their wives had been there, they'd have been like, you're drunk, go and sit down. <laughs> you know, PD's stop speaking. So we maybe wouldn't have had all of these uh, angelic visits and different things. Um, so uh, Aunt, Auntie Queenie's asked for a third choice that she kind of enjoyed the temple. Auntie Queenie, I'll add that now. Um, Julian, did you have something to say? No, I, I, I think I've already said it, but I just, again, wanted to just re-emphasize this, that, that it, it wasn't a bad thing. <laughs> These people all getting drunk in the temple was not a bad thing. And it's probably what they needed. You know, society needs these things. Outlets. You know, yeah, they need these outlets. Uh, and and if we if we focus on what is the real, get rid of the, this, the kind of, 
and I don't even want to say get rid of it, but you know, let's forget about the mumbo jumbo angel standing as sentinels. It thing. was bonding, so, wasn't it? You know, look at if if you take something much simpler, you know, you look at the sacrament. Okay, we we don't as a uh, as a religion we don't believe in transubstantiate transubstantiation. There is no magic to the sacrament. You know, we don't believe that that um, the 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 tokens mean anything. It doesn't matter whether it's water, vimto, wine, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's what it means to us. It's the effect that it has on us. This idea of us all kind of sitting together, partaking in what is essentially a communal meal where Christ is at the centre of this. You know, that works on us psychologically, you know, and it helps flick that... that um, that hive switch in our brains that makes us think less of ourselves and more of other people and, and, and part of something bigger. And that's what the temple should be all about, is this idea of, of flicking that hive switch so that we look outside of ourselves and want to be part of something bigger. And, and, and we can do that. And we, I think they had it right. We could get it there again if that was our real focus. Okay. You sound like you really want it back. I, I, just, I think it would be an easy win, if I'm honest. Yeah. Is that why you're building that altar over there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Don't build a bed for the temple. <laughs> um, so 21st century saints just saying there that the women were full part participants in this as well. Um, I wasn't putting the women down, Jane. I was just saying that you're more sensible than we are. Um, and that... At least in my experience, the the female of the species tends to be a little bit more realistic and sensible um, in these matters. But the women eventually did get to partake in all the temple um, stuff when we got to Nauvoo, and the temple ceremony changed um, because Joseph's, I guess, position changed. Um, we got uh, the Nauvoo Charter. We got a Freemason's Lodge in Nauvoo where all of the brethren started joining the Freemasons. And then we got the new Nauvoo temple ceremony that had the washings and anointings, the clothing and a garment, and then added the instructional and testing phases um, that we're more familiar with today with uh, the Garden of Eden in, in the creation um signs and tokens with um what do they call them oh with penalties penalties uh a prayer circle and the test at the veil where you are tested on um your signs and tokens and we can see there there's a sister um in her full um robes an artist impression of the time and she's actually holding a dagger because at the time um, they used to uh, cut into um, your garments, literally in the ceremony, um, to make the certain marks and yeah, sacred symbols. So, yeah, anyone? Pretty full on, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> what, when, when did they experience masonry? What's the timeline here? Because the general perception is that literally within months, several of weeks. Joseph Smith okay. being inducted of a mason or weeks, a um, weeks, that's when it all went towards the Masonic idea of the journey and much more symbolism and all these other ingredients came in and the signs and the tokens, particularly. Um, is this before 1842 or about the same time? So um, it's 1842. You know, the timeline. Yeah. I've, I've and... done a video on this. It definitely, Joseph Smith was a master mason, and then several weeks later, he, he instituted this. The church admits it. Yeah. So the, there's a quote in the book um, from Parley P. Pratt describing the event um, a little over a month later. So he was describing um, his washing and anointing and being ordained a priest um uh in the company of nine others so when he was ordained to the quorum of the anointed um and endowed so he speaks and a little ways down he says we have organized a lodge here speaking of Nauvoo, of masons since we obtained a charter that was in march 
since that there has has near 200 been made masons brother joseph and sydney was the first that was received into the lodge all of the 12 have become members except awesome p he hangs back he will make up he will wake up soon there is a similarity of uh, priesthood in masonry brother joseph says masonry was taken from the priesthood but has become degenerated by many things uh, but many things are perfect so yeah that was um ooh, what did he say march in march nearly 200 of them became masons and <clears throat> the strange events he's speaking of with his endowments etc were june so it's, it's mm. very soon afterwards laura mm. um so i was listening just before this i was listening to um a year of polygamy episode i'm gonna rely heavily on some of the information on there it's episode 170 if you if you get to because i probably won't do it anywhere near justice but um this idea of uh, masonry it being a it's a corrupted version of what uh heavenly father wanted us to to actually know in the temple ceremony and this kind of is like a um a bit of a theme and a pattern with joseph so he absolutely denied um polygamy but plural marriage was the um proper and correct way that that they should be um living marriage so polygamy absolutely not denied that wrote you know got loads of women to sign to say that they weren't living polygamy but plural marriage is a completely different thing um and um lindsay hanson park has a theory that the endowment was um created um for the purpose it was is it, integral to polygamy because um through emma smith so um anointings and endowments were promised to her if she was on board with with polygamy and first wives were given their their second anointing second anointings kind of dropped off the dropped off the map after a little while when brigham um not long after brigham but certainly to start with if people were having their second anointings and the idea of having this kind of um these um uh what was my train of thought with the idea of plural marriage being okay but not polygamy like this higher law and this lower law we in the in the media re recently we've had an awful lot about other fundamentalist movements and a lot of other fundamentalist movements will say that lds we're the, they're out of order they're they're not um they've changed so many times with our temple endowments and other things that we are not we've not got the correct priesthood um and so lds are the lower law and you'll have some people in mostly in america but probably many other places um, they will go to the LDS church in the morning on a Sunday to live the lower law. And then though in the afternoon, they will live the higher law and they're living the law of consecration and polygamy and all these other um, original uh, doctrines. Um, what's interesting, this terminology higher law came has now come into the temple, into the LDS temple, which is if, if somebody was to look up the higher law, um, there's like a lots of historical precedents in terms of it being used for polygamy and for law of consecration and all of those kind of higher law um, laws. And so if you've got somebody who is using our LDS temples, but is actually fundamentalist in mentality, it's really weird because they're turning up to an LDS temple and they are covenanting for all the things that they're already living um, using the higher law terminology. So it's a bit of a weird, weird wording to put into our temple because yeah. it's got such a historical backstory. I've just, I've looked up the dates uh, on when Joseph Smith became a Mason and when he instituted the endowment. And this is from the church's website. Um, so Joseph got Smith... Got to be right then. Yeah. Joseph Smith received um, his Masonic initiation on March the 15th, 1842. On May the 3rd, 1842, Joseph Smith enlisted a few men to prepare the space in his red brick store in which the Narvin Masons met, preparatory to giving endowments to a few elders. And that's a quote there. The next day, Joseph introduced the Temple Endowments for the first time to nine men, all of whom were also Masons. One of these men, Heber C. Kimball, wrote his experience down. Wow. So it was March, he became a Mason, went super quick through it all, and then by May, he had instituted the endowment yeah so it's, well, it's it's a matter of weeks well i just want to say as well 
um, on this this next slide before we get to the whole Freemasonry thing, because we are going to touch on that. We're not going to go through everything because there is just so much, but we'll touch on it. Um, but coming back to the idea that these temples were not just um, for this whole endowment thing to go on. Um, you can see it's a poor cross section, but it's the best one I could find on the internet. You've got a basement, which is the baptistry standard, but then in between, you've got two floors of assembly rooms in the mm -hmm. Nauvoo temple, and the endowment section was like bunged in the attic. Um, and you can see the, the floor plan here, oh, here on the right of the attic story of the temple with um, the, the garden rooms, etc., and offices around. So the temples really were a multi-purpose building. It wasn't just for the endowments. You know, the majority of that building is for uh, people meeting together and, and having an assembly place. So hmm. just thought that was interesting. And, and of course, the Nauvoo Temple, the rebuilt Nauvoo Temple, is, it's got the, the same layout or certainly very similar layout. And so you've got these big assembly rooms yeah. that are never used. Or, I, was, or I don't know. Maybe they are used. I don't know what they're used for. I was thinking then, because we went to the Nauvoo Temple and they've got like a part of it is like the Kirtland Temple. As you go in off to the left, you've got it's like the, the assembly Kirtland. rooms, yeah. Is that with the, the pulpits? Yeah. yeah. And then off to the right, there's other rooms. Yeah. Right. So this document here is from the Utah Lighthouse Ministry from the Tanners themselves, and it's fantastic. But if just as a um, a kind of idea as to how much there is in there. Um, just looking at the table they've put together of similarities between Freemasonry of the 1830s and the Mormon endowment pre-1940, they've got 26 um, sections here where there are similarities uh, that they've outlined. And we're not going to go through them all because there are the covenants in there that we said we would not talk about in these broadcasts. Um, but anyone who wants to go and look for themselves, the link to that is down in the show notes. Um, Can I just say something on that, uh, yeah. PD, on the whole Masonic thing? Are we going? Are we going to talk about the, the Masonic link? We now? are going there now. Yeah. So um, I don't think a lot, a lot, it doesn't bother me. The, Mas the Masonic link doesn't really bother me, and I think what happens now is we, you know, most people don't know. It's not something that that was common knowledge. Um, you know, certainly when I was kind of growing up in the temple, it wasn't common knowledge. Um, and when we find out we're like, you know, the shock, horror, there's links to the, the to Freemasonry. Um, it didn't bother the, the early members. And, you know, and they were both. These are people that were, were intimately um, familiar with Freemasonry and, and the endowment. And it didn't bother them. And I know that, you know, there is this idea of, of Masonry being a corrupted form of the original endowment. Um, I this is a rubbish source. I'm sorry, um, but I've definitely you you gave that kind of quote about Joseph saying that that it had been like a corrupted version. I have read in non Mormon books um, where the, or certainly a non Mormon book. I remember reading about the fact that they'd said that that there is this understanding in in masonry that the real kind of secrets have been lost and that they would be restored. You know, It's almost like it was written by a Mormon, but I, I assure you it was. It, it's a book. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's called um, The Hiram Key. And it's very kind of Graham Hancock kind of um, esque sort of pseudo historic stuff. But that was, you know, a source that's, that says that same idea that, 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 that that's a Masonic belief. I don't know whether that's true or not. Um, and there are lots of these elements that are found in Freemasonry that are also found in other ancient um, temple ceremonies as well. Um, I'm sorry. I know that sounds really kind of... Some people aren't going to like me saying that. I, d I don't think it really matters. I don't think whether it's... You know, and, and even if Joseph did just go, well, let's, let's copy that from Fre Freemasonry. Again, what's important is... The function, its utility, is really what should like the, the 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 center of this. How does it work? How does it help us? How does it work? Yeah, I I think 
maybe on the flip side to that coin, um, you've got the Tanner's conclusion. And I know, you know, the Tanners aren't God. None of us are, but they know a lot. Um, and they've they've concluded here uh, that even Masonic scholars and historians admit that the Masonic rituals do not originate in Solomon's Temple in Jerusalem, as the Masonic legend relates, mm -hmm. uh, but were an outgrowth of the European Builders Guild of the late Middle Ages. This weakens the Mormon belief that the endowment ritual was given to Adam in the Garden of Eden it seems much more obvious that Joseph Smith used basic elements from the 19th century Masonic ritual um, and the Mormon endowment ritual is not ancient at all. So I guess that's, that's the other side to it. Some people will say, well, that proves that it's Tosh and you're saying obviously it doesn't matter. Um, there is but... another element to, I mean, I, I used to, this was something that was a real, a real interest to me, you know, when I was studying ancient history, um, and I, I remember calling, when I was working on my dissertation, I remember calling Laura up from the library, the university library, and kind of whispering to her, I've just found this Egyptian scroll that is amazing. And I can't tell you about it because it's showing things from the, the temple, but it's fantastic. And, and you know, and I, I, I took it home. It was, sorry, I'm saying that it was a scroll. Um, was it scroll? Yeah, it was. It was. It was. It was. It was the breathings. It was no, no. It was um, the papyri, the funerary papyri of Nessie Parkar Shooty. If you want to, <laughs> I've got a copy of it. If you want to, if anybody wants a copy, Google of it, it now. I, I I can show you, and it was, um, and it just blew my mind at the time, and and, and I and, and I had this really strong belief that you you could create. And I still do believe this. You you can create the Mormon endowment from from ancient sources. Um, however, and this is me now, kind of on the other side of things, trying to be a little bit more balanced and fair. When we do this, it only works if we ignore all the things that don't match. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? There there are you know there are. I can show you. Um, I can show you a papyrus that, that has got um, the deceased doing. Um, various different signs from the Mormon endowment. Um, and you can look at that and go, wow, there we go. It's ancient origin. But then that same papyrus will also show somebody with a, a, the head of a crocodile, you know, yeah. a, a, or, or something else. Didn't you get to do that at the temple? But is, the no, no, that's a different <laughs> a different ceremony. I, that I, I, I'm, I'm, no, I haven't done that one yet. Um, but But that's how it works. It works when you ignore all the things that don't match up. Yeah, it's it's, it's like the church's thing, but yeah. Sorry. Bullseye. It's like the church's bullseye theory. Joseph yeah. got one thing perfectly right, but there were thirty other things around it exactly, that yeah. he was he was off on. Um but he got one thing, bullseye. So he, it must be true. It's that kind of Had you thing. Julian, had you already come across Hugh Nibley making those connections with ancient stuff and doing the the parallels and so on at that point, or did you find that independently of him? What who sorry? Hugh We have, have you... hundreds of blooming Hugh Nibley books just over there. Yeah. Yeah. So so what I have you know, and, and and so you know, he'd, the, had he switched you on to looking for those things there then yeah yeah 100 percent. you know and when i did when so i did, did a um a degree in, in archaeology and ancient history and you know and that was heavily inf and i loved it you know i'm not i'm not bemoaning that but it was heavily influenced by by the church uh, and the stuff that i'd been reading at the time um and yeah indiana jones and in yeah and indiana jones as well <laughs> um Excellent. kept the whip um yeah yeah it so, was. so i mean interest yeah so the the apologists today though and, and in a sense having to jump through the same hoops now that they have accepted all this history that yes of course joseph you know you've got the givens calling joseph smith an eclectic syncretist you know trying to the best spin they can put on accepting the reality of this real history of the endowment and the Book of Mormon and all that stuff and the parallelomania um, is to somehow turn that into a positive, which is kind of what you're offering, Julian. We, and what, what we're saying is we have to reframe our concept of Mormonism. 
we have to reframe it from these. Uh, this is a genuine, literal restoration of ancient rituals as they were. And the, the LDS church clearly doesn't believe that for a nanosecond because they have changed everything about the endowment. Almost every component of it has been messed about with and they're still tinkering with it. And, Breg and President Nelson has now just declared point blank that they have the right to change it any way they feel like in the future. He said mm. that publicly with no justification, no theological framework, just it's an ongoing thing. There will be more changes. Um, so this is, you know, what we're discussing here really is the car crash of this literal, we are a restoration of ancient stuff from the Old Testament era, um, belief of fundamentally, or from of basic foundational Mormonism to how can we nuance this up now? I, my personal view is we absolutely can have a Mormon kosher framework for this in that the whole idea of Mormonism at its best is meant to be that we're on a very long journey of learning, that we, we find all the information we can from everywhere, all the wisdom that we see through a glass darkly. We have no idea yet what God really is um, and we're reaching towards it. And that ritual and metaphor and the, and we've still got many more things to learn. It's in our articles of faith. There are yet to be many things revealed and explained. And if we truly embrace that, we stop playing this stupid game of, um, you know, oh, nothing can change. You know, that Mormonism is, is we become like the Pharisees where you must not change anything. We're going to be Orthodox Jews and we'll keep adding to things to keep it in the past rather than being able to reframe it like the reform movements do within Judaism and other religions. Um, so I just find it interesting that how we're bouncing around here between how can we still find value in the endowment, um, even though we know it is heavily plagiarized from masonry and so on. My personal journey with this is that, um, that uh, you know, growing up as a kid, masonry was, was terrifying. It was this sinister conspiracy going on. There were scandals in, in the news and in politics in the 70s and 80s that everyone knew that all the police chiefs in the country were Freemasons and they were keeping themselves extremely secretive. And there was these big discussions in Parliament about whether they, and, and I think they did pass some laws that the senior police officers had to leave Masonry if they were going to continue to serve. I mm -hmm. don't know if I remember that entirely accurately, but it was that fear and terror of this completely mysterious organisation that was very much keeping its secrets. These days, you've got series on television, you know, being very open about what they do and trying to demystify, which is exactly what the Mormons are doing about the temple now. Um, so it's really interesting. There's this parallel. They've learned from Freemasons how to re completely reconfigure the fear and suspicion about them by opening the doors and showing people joining Masonry. Um, and so my, my first sort of car crash with this was on my mission. Uh, where one of the branch presidency and the, the branch one over in Alabama was a Freemason. Um, and one of the people I baptized was a Freemason, I found out. And I'm like, hang on a minute, here we are in the Bible Belt and there's all these Christian Freemasons. How does that even work? Um, and then you start to find out there are Mormon Masons. And, and what's happened bizarrely, like completely to my amazement, is I've made good friends with um, an American guy, family man in Utah who loves masonry and Mormonism and is heartbroken at what the church is doing to the endowment to end it as a live endowment experience, to take out all the things that actually make it truly meaningful because they're, they're, they're neutering it of all the rich ingredients that Freemasonry um, brings to Mormonism. And they're slowly filtering it out, as we've said, to just make it a cookie cutter McDonald's um, yeah. chore to go to the temple, not the mystical encounter with with God and the, philosoph the philosophy behind it all. There's so much rich symbolism there that we can adore. And then it started to happen to the Brits. Um, my One of my buddies who I was in sunbeams with as a three-year-old um, has left the church. Um, and it absolutely embraced Freemasonry. He's having an, a whale of a time with it. He loves it. Um, one of the members of my previous ward, a young guy, has has become a Mason. And I think he's sort of bounced back between activity. I don't know. But, but the point is, they are finding in Freemasonry 
what they used to have in the church in the sense of fraternity, deep philosophy, challenging intellectual um, thoughts about the meaning of life and your purpose and value associated with ritual, which we used to offer. And they're now literally Mormons going back to Freemasonry in the raw to find it and and actually develop much further. Because the other sort of the final thing I mentioned here is the another epiphany I've had is how utterly unelaborate the temple endowment is compared to masonry. It is it is totally vanilla. Freemasonry itself involves learning books and books of knowledge, e- extremely elaborate rituals, you know, up the get go. And all we can manage is a little bit of embroidery on an apron. And that's yeah. kind of it. You know, it's it's extremely pared down. So which also, in a way, begs questions, well, why? You know what? And this is one thing Joseph Smith did. He simplified things. He simplified stuff. He took Catholicism and Protestant ritual, simplified it to the bare minimum, bread and water, no special clothing particularly, simple prayers, simple rituals for baptism, no incense and smells and bells. And even when he dipped his toe into the elaborate, the the temple endowment, particularly today, obviously it's more neutered than it was, um, was still very much a, a very simple pared down minimalist sort of version of some of the few points that he picked up from masonry um it is you know it's and yet when we go to the temple it's still a shock because it is so elaborate compared to our normal sunday stuff you know it's this whole spectrum that we're we're juggling you know and and dropping on the floor and breaking at the moment as a religion well auntie queenie agrees with you uh masonry is meaningful experience when the mormon temple is empty um, did anyone else hear mm-hmm. the explanation? This is what I was told in my youth, why loads of older uh, Mormons were Freemasons and why a lot of the leaders of the church were. And it was because uh, there were Masonic lodges all over the United States and Europe. And when the brethren were, were traveling, there wasn't always places to stay. So if there were Masons, they could always go to the local lodge and it was more of a I never heard that really yeah that's that's what I was that was how it was explained to me yeah We're like why are they masons and yeah. mormons and that's why we don't have mason why all the brethren aren't masons now maybe um because mm. we've got hotels they can just so, stay at marriott yeah <laughs> I've, not, I've not heard that <laughs> I mean, it is interesting this, no. you've, you've definitely got that idea is definitely true of joseph's time the you know joseph became a, a mason because it was useful it was yeah. hand for him to be coming mm-hmm. out it would offer a, a certain degree of of protection you know a time where they've been driven mm-hmm. from place to place that's what we were taught that's definitely what i was taught yeah. as a kid. You know, when you, it was to, like, it was just playing was, the system to protect the church from the powerful yeah. before yeah. he was he was shot he gave the masonic sign of of distress about to say yeah yeah you know it, oh it, lord it, my god Exactly, you know, uh, and we don't, re- you know, when we t- when we talk about that in church, we don't we don't call it out for what it was. It was a masonic sign of distress because there were probably masons there in the crowd, in the mob. And this was his way of saying, "Hey, hey, guys, I'm one of you. You're supposed to you're supposed to help me. You're supposed to protect me." Yeah, because um, it's, it was like a thing that if you're in war and another mason says to you, like the thing, "Oh Lord, my God, is there no help for the widow's son?" then that is, you know, you're supposed to like switch sides. You're supposed to help the person. Even if you're on the other side in the war, in the civil war or whatever, you're supposed to help that person because the fraternity of masonry comes first. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Which is interesting as well, isn't it? When you consider the fact that, um, so there are, there are tokens in masonry that are, um, that allow you to recognize a, a, a mason. So when you meet somebody, you can give this token. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm using very vague language because I want to be respectful, both of masons and, and um, Mormons. Um, but the, the, you know, you can give a token that will allow you to recognize another, um, another mason, a fellow mason. And, and, and that's where this idea of kind of corruption in the police and other things c- comes into it, you know, but, but, the idea is also that that's a good thing. You, you know, we have that 
obviously in, in, in Mormonism, I've definitely experienced this. You, you meet somebody else that is a Mormon, can be a complete stranger to you, but you, you will trust them more and you will afford them more of your time. And, you, you know, that's just that's just human nature, isn't it? Um, so there, there's that element within um, within masonry. Now, we have tokens in, in the Mormon endowment that in a similar way are used to help us to kind of recognise somebody that is um, that has been endowed or initiated or whatever, but we don't use it except in the in the, the temple. Um, and I wonder whether that was always the case when there was this urgency in the early church to endow all of these missionaries before they go um, out into the world to empower them in some way. And that is something similar to what you were saying there, PD, but that is something that they could have gone from town to town and identified themselves in this way that would have got them, you know, got them an, an in with, with, with Masons and, it, and afforded a level of um, of help. It's a bit of an insurance policy, isn't it? Mm. A bit of extra security. Mm. Okay, I don't think I'm out of line showing this image, okay? Everyone's going to shoot shoot me. So people who know will know. But this is a, this was a, an image that showed up in the news, okay, of Thomas S. Monson meeting George Bush. Oh, yeah, yeah. To... Oh, at least George Bush is a well-known Mason, and they're meeting and greeting one another as Masons. Okay, I won't say how that how I know that is. Um, there has been Just watch the eyebrows. Yeah, it's the eyebrows. Uh, so people who know will <laughs> it's know the way Henry B. Iring's looking at him. Yeah, but they're yeah. they're greeting each other as Masons, and and that's the thing. You know, if if the president of the Mormon Church. Uh, greets the president of the United States and they've got that fraternity then it breaks the ice straight away and you know there's there's benefit there social benefit so okay we'll we'll leave George alone um to go play with himself um and then we get to our final slide Joseph Smith's opinion on changes so taken from the August 2001 Enzyme on page 24 in bold print above a large colorful portrait of Joseph Smith. The prophet Joseph Smith taught ordinances instituted in the heavens before the foundation of the world in the priesthood for the salvation of men are not to be altered or changed. Mm. Hmm. I don't know. Th- and this is the... Um... If you're going, if you go and we don't have this again in the in the UK and not so much in Europe, maybe a, a bit more in Europe. Um, but over in the States, you um, have a lot of other um, restoration movements, fundamental community. I'm not talking about FLDS with a big F. I'm talking about FLDS with a little F, fundamental uh, Mormons. And uh, they've got their own temples. And for a while, some of them would um, use LDS temples. But as things change more and more, um, some of them have now built their own and they're using their own temples and have tried to, as much as possible, um, use something that was uh, much more akin to Joseph's endowment because of that exact quote, because they believe that nothing should have been taken away from yeah. from the original endowment and and that is where we're going to come to a close this evening because i think that is we've we've given a high level view of possibly maybe some of the reasons for the endowment coming into play and the development of the endowment as i say uh, mormon scholars and ex-mormon scholars will do a much better job and could do hours and hours and hours on just those topics um, but what we want to do is to just kind of do a high level review um, of the, you know, the main the main talking points and have it all in one place um, for people to discuss. So um, that's what we're doing. We're going to end there in Nauvoo next time in a couple of weeks. Hopefully we will pick up um, with the church and the temple in Salt Lake City um, and how Brigham Young impacted upon the temple ceremony with the lecture at the veil etc and how that changed um just a few years after joseph um shuffled off this mortal coil but guys do we have any closing remarks is there anything that you you feel you want to add yeah i want to know the results of the poll 
we'll get there. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, just 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 before Julian, at the moment, as might be expected, sixty nine percent of people said no, they didn't enjoy um, the temple. Thirty one percent of people said they did. Everyone can vote if you're on YouTube. Go and do that. Um, like and subscribe at the same time. But yeah, we'll close that in a moment after we've done final final thoughts. Um, but you might expect with an ex-Mormon audience that you get a lot more no's than yeses. Well, I still think 31 is fair. To have a third a third of people that were happy or comfortable enough to say that they did, you know. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, it was never my bag, but, it, but I appreciate that people find yeah. things in there. Julian. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to kind of, um, for full disclosure, you know, I, I don't believe that in fact, just in case it because uh, you know, I think it's important to be positive um, and I want to be positive um, but for people that don't might not know you know I don't believe that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is true or that Joseph Smith was a prophet or that the the the, the um, temple endowment was given to him by God I think you know it, there might have been some inspiration in there Um I don't think I probably don't really believe that there is a God, and or if there is, he's, he's as likely to be some computer programmer in his no. sitting in his bedroom you, as you know, as, yeah, as, as you like actually a, just scared Peter off. I literally had to do. Yeah. I literally had to do some fox shouting, and, and there is I love your fox watch, Peter, um, and there is part of me that once the whole thing, the whole um, Mormon church and, and religion generally to just go away, yeah? Because I think there are some things that are fundamentally um, bad about it and and, 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 and problematic. Um, but I also want to, you know, when when I can acknowledge the good and the benefit that, that, that is there. And and so, you know, my I, I think this idea of Joseph, you know, saying that they, they shouldn't change, well, they should change, they should change. And, and, and the... The at the heart of it should be utility. Should you know how does this help human beings? How does it help the people that are going through um, this experience? And I think there are things that that could be beneficial from it. Unfortunately, I think a lot of those things that we did have have been stripped away. And I think you know it would um, you know it could be a much better experience for people that that went there. And I think that's a good thing for, for those that, that do still believe. I think it could be be helpful. Awesome. I because you were really talking earlier, like you wanted the temple back, and you were about to go like bang on the door for a temple recommend, like they want you to. Has been told by Elder Turley to get there. Yeah, yeah by week. But Turley, Peter. sorry, Turley. Peter. Hi. Just three quick things. So one, um, the Jewish uh, font, or is called a mikva, M I K V E H. And it involves full immersion and it's it's part of cleansing rituals that can happen throughout your life at different points or for a convert. So which raises for me, it's been really interesting, the idea of Joseph Smith did um, have quite close relationship with one or two Jewish visitors who he learned a lot from at various points. So it may be he, he actually picked up some of that uh, temple stuff, not just from because that's not in masonry as far as I know. Um, that maybe he he it was his conversations with traditional Jews um, that introduced some of that to him. Um, so that could be one of the sources there because that that's the theme there. Um, the other is August the 9th at last is the release date for a book called Method Infinite, which is meant to be like the ultimate analysis of the relationship between Freemasonry and Mormonism and the temple. Um, wow. It's been in the offing for for, for several years. Um, really high level academic Mormon Masons and Masons and Mormons have been working on it. So it's actually happening August the 9th. It's going to be released on Amazon. Um, I think my third point is I think the fact that so many people can find out all about this online and they are literally doing surveys referencing people, you know, the details from the church in their surveys of the de- of what are your why do you feel weird about the temple is it the masonic links things like that um plus that this book is about to be published and we'll we'll introduce a lot more sort of focus on it in academic communities which the 
Mormon insider intelligence who are very aware of, you know, the, the church's own historians. Surely this is part of the reason to come full circle to why this month's enzyme has this emphasis on being a bit more open and honest about what goes there and trying to demystify it, trying to get somehow ahead of the curve and start to frame it as not sinister people casting superstitious spells on you, but a sort of a a ritual methodology for something much less scary, you know, which is the general apologist approach now. Um, so I think we're in a really interesting moment, um, you know, regarding the temple. They're being spammed across the earth and they're going to end up closing because no one can go to them. They're trying to demystify them. They're showing <laughs> temple garments f from a few years ago on, on YouTube things because they're desperate to stop the church seeming so weird. In doing so, they're killing the, 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 egg, the, the goose that lays the golden eggs. They're taking, they're killing the mystical immersive shared theater in the round experience of a live endowment there will be no more live endowments now nelson has has stopped them in mantai and salt lake and he's literally destroyed the salt lake temple gutted it of all of its art and it's going to be a mac temple like the others so this is a moment to really consider what does the temple even mean to mormons anymore how are we going to interact with it? What should it be? What are we losing in this rampant destruction of it ritually and physically, artistically, the whole thing? And we need to decide as a religion, do we really care about it and want it? Do we even understand why we got it in the first place? And what are we about to lose? And is it too much? And will it kill the church even faster? Um, <laughs> good Thank topic, you. PD. Thank you. Nemo. Yeah. Yeah, I, man. I would like to make a prediction. I think there are going to be some fundamental changes to the endowment, um, or certainly to the way that members access the temple moving forward. I think I know that Julian said he's not sure that they really care about getting more people in. I think there's some truth to that. I think temples are very much a symbol of power for the church. If you put a temple somewhere, it's a it's a sign of, of a signal of intent. Uh, and they have lots of people moved to that area. See, the Lord told us to put something here to prepare for the influx of members, even though the influx of members was caused by the building of the temple. There's a lot of that sort of stuff that's going to be going on. But I also think they don't want temples to sit empty. I think a temple sitting empty will, we will talk about it <laughs> if yeah. no one else. You know, people will talk about it if temples are empty. So I think we're going to see some changes. I'm not sure quite what form they'll take whether something like a short a short veil ceremony would allow you to go and spend time in the celestial room whether they become more open um to people or they start to encourage people to come and spend time in the celestial room even if they've only done baptisms or even if they've only done some washings and anointings whether they're going to take some of the emphasis off the endowment i don't know i know what it is what i know what it is so they're going to say that the temple is the only place where you're allowed to drink alcohol. <laughs> Magic uh, mushrooms. Uh, yeah. that's, that's, that's the change. <laughs> okay. Uh, but so. yeah, and I think I think we'll see that. And I think, but I think the thing that won't go will be the ne the necessity of tithing to enter the temple. I think prophets will hold on to that with their cold, dead hands before they. Look oh, back. I thought you were going to say that was going to go. No. I was going to say no. Interesting that always going to be pay to play. Yeah, that was one of the earliest requirements as well. Yeah, word of wisdom, obviously not, <laughs> but the tithing was, was always going right to pay to play because there. that is that is far more fundamental, I think, than we sometimes realise to the Mormon experience. This idea that it is transactional, that you give money in return for status within the church. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for coming and. For everyone who has stayed with us uh, until this point, you will now be rewarded with a story from the temple from PD. Um, but nice. before I do, um, let us remind you the 100 likes, we're on 39 likes at the moment, everyone. The YouTube algorithm is uh, a wicked woman uh, who hates me and always puts my videos right at the bottom. So <laughs> if we all click the like button, she will put me at the top. Thank you. Also, PD has 989 subscribers. The thousand mark with YouTube 
is uh, a big mark because that means your account can change and we get more good stuff and we can do more fun things so if you're watching right now and you've not subscribed you can click the little button in the bottom right hand corner of the screen or you can just yeah just do it 11 people that's all we need and um it'll take mm. us to another level so the story one sec before your story before your story Go on. i just want to encourage people to also do that old-fashioned thing of talking to another person if you can think of someone that you think would like what pd does tell uh, them about it too share Actually, share the joy if you, if, if, share. if you can think, all bring one friend to the next podcast <laughs> Nino, i thought you was gonna say if we hit a thousand subscribers right now you were gonna take your shirt off i thought that's I, what you hang on saying. i will Ooh. i will <laughs> okay if, if you hit a thousand subscribers before the end of this i will take my shirt off okay let's Watch see uh, oh, we're, we're up one we're up to 990. Everyone, seriously, yeah, everyone. Nemo's going to take his shirt off. So I'm going to tell the story and then I'm going to refresh. Um, so you've probably got, <laughs> you've got your garments three, under it. Three or four minutes. It's too warm in the um, for my garments. To, to do that. But uh, so I was still an active member of the church. So still wore my garments, etc. My parents were um, the temple president and matron at the Preston Temple. So all of our uh, family events were at the Preston Temple. So whenever we wanted to go and visit my parents and take the kids and it was just us, um, we would, yeah, we'd, we'd go up to the temple and stay the night. And sometimes we took the dog. Now we've got a small black dog and she's a spaniel. She likes to get muddy. And the inside of the Temple President's house, imagine the celestial room everywhere, okay? It's the thick cream carpets with the carved patterns um, the walls are cream, the dado rails are gold. The furniture is actually old furniture from the celestial room that has been replaced. And then they take it and put it in the temple president's house if it's still in good nick. Um, the armchairs were from the um, uh, dedication of the temple, Gordon B. Hinckley's chair. Uh, so it's a very special place. And we take this black dog. And I think my parents just wanted to see me. So they're like, yeah, bring the dog. Why not? Um, there's cleaners that will come and clean it. I didn't get that. Could you try again? Sorry, Siri, no. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> what, what happened this one night was um, I was staying in the apartments at the back of uh, the Temple President's house. And my dog wanted to go out to use the bathroom. And there's some lovely grounds just around Temple President's house, but there's no fence. And a black dog, no lights out. So I'm calling her and calling her. And then I hear a commotion in the bushes. So I step outside, just wearing my garments, hear another commotion, go a bit further. I'm going towards the temple now. And I had to literally walk into the bushes. But these bushes, for anyone that knows the Preston Temple, just on the other side of the bushes are the car parks. Okay. With, with the temple lit up. And I literally walked through this bush and found myself stood in the middle of the night, calling my dog, Jess, who was having a roaring time in the car park. Okay, stood in my garments in the car park at the temple, just looking up at Moroni, thinking, what is going on? And security let my dad know. He was awake when I got back because they were like, who, what is going on in the car park at the temple? So, but I like to think that there will have been, um, you know, a, a, a lovely sister or a brother who were at the temple at that time who saw an angel. <laughs> okay. And they've recounted that story, that testimony building story of this angel regaling the temple. Jess, mm -hmm. Jess is in oh, dressed, you. dressed all in white, you know, and the, the glow of the, Car park lights coming off of my um, shiny head. So and you yeah, know, I, down the lines, they'll 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 say, "Oh, he said Jesus, Jesus." It won't be Jess anymore. Yes. They'll change it. Jesus. So yeah, so that's my temple story um, okay. from from there. Unfortunately, Nemo, you, you get to keep your shirt on. That's a real we're, shame. I was going to go for some Adam and Eve level nudity, like here. I was just going to show shoulders up like this. Yeah, yeah. porn shoulders. What are you I'm, dancing with? 
Peter. I could see I could see Julian frantically creating YouTube accounts to subscribe to you. <laughs> I did consider it. I did consider it. Okay. So making a oh, hey, folks, uh, folks, there's always next time, isn't there? There's yes. always well, well yeah. Let, let's hope that PD doesn't hit a thousand before the next video. Oh come on! No, you've just totally reversed. Right, stop! What's going stop on. subscribing! Oh, stop it! <laughs> stop it now! Yeah, nine people. That's all we need, and we get to see uh, Nemo's nips. Whoa, whoa, hang okay. on! No, 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 no! <laughs> this was a one-time thing. It's a one-time thing. This was this podcast only. Okay, well, well let's wrap you it let up. Let us know whether you want right. to or the, not. The, talk to the listeners. This is this is how the Brit the... Ventures roll. I'm yeah. the only one who's excommunicated. I'm the only one still wearing garments. Okay. <laughs> We, like I said, this, my studio is too warm. This podcast finished five minutes ago. This is the after party that we usually get into. Yeah. Um, that maybe, maybe if we all agree one time, we can do kind of a, a competition for people to come into an after party. Yes. Um, and yeah, not not paid. Just run a competition for five people to join us in an after party on one of the podcasts, and mm. that'd be fun. Sometime. There's a Good lot fun. of nudity. <laughs> yes right then um so that's it thank you then. <laughs> thanks everyone thanks big brother nearly uh 1k subscribers remember big brother it's a flat stationary plane um leave your tips with the paypal link if you feel you've had a good time and i will catch you on the next one thank you you wonderful people see you later. um have a good one see ya. Bye. bye